So gender and interdisciplinarity. Um, so when, when I uh, thought about what to talk about in um, this session, um, I was sort of uh, wondering, you know, I haven't worked much in museums, what can I do? Um, and then I thought, okay, let's look at this in, in connection with a project that I have, this one on interdisciplinarity that you have seen several of us um, here participating in Perak. So we've been working on interdisciplinarity. I've been giving talks about this um, in, uh, in the past, but uh, and, and obviously all these interdisciplinary um, uh, relations uh, have collections. So I said, okay, I will try to uh, put this um, together and try to think about what I've been looking about the history of interdisciplinarity from the gender perspectives. So, and um, so I will have some questions or try to answer some questions of what, uh, like what uh, was interdisciplinarity an alternative form of to access the discipline for, especially for women? Uh, was this process different to that taking place in other disciplines? So was archeology span um, just uh, uh, um, an exception? And are the national trends? So are the pro this process, is, is this process different in different countries? And uh, so, um, what? Uh, uh, so there are two then main um, aspects to this um, talk. One is um, gender, and the other one interdisciplinarity. So let's just start with interdisciplinarity to explain. Uh, I think that uh, you probably all know, but just uh, just very briefly, uh, a discipline is a grant of knowledge that has instruction, learning, teaching, of education. So um, that, but that, so what we mean then by interdisciplinarity is when some uh, several of these disciplines get together and people start to collaborate. So, <clears throat> what uh, uh, what was happening then at the start of interdisciplinarity? When is the when when did the interdisciplinarity um, started? If we can go back to the 19th century and talk about this uh, mid Kitchen Midden Commission, the first one uh, in sort of 1849, 1869, and um, taking place uh, in Scandinavia. And what we see is that everybody at that time that was sort of getting together and collaborate in uh, projects uh, were men. The same happened in the second Kitchen Meeting Commission um, later on uh, in the century going into the 19th, uh, in the, the 20th um, century. So we see here a photograph of several of the second uh, Kitchen Meeting Commission that really were organizing themselves. They had geologists, osteologists, zoologists, botanists, and so on, all getting um, together. So where were the women? Were they women at all? Why only men uh, making all these connections? Uh, we know that uh, at that time, the first women started to go into the discipline. And one of the first ones was Johanna Mesto, um, who um, got a job or started first to work at the voluntary uh, basis in the Museum of Antiquities of Kiel. And, um, and she then got a job and also um, ended up uh, being uh, a professor but very late on in her life at the university. But, the, I mean, why wasn't she, she was one of the translators of what was going on in Scandinavia. Why didn't she try to do something similar in Germany if she was really the, the, the person who was allowing this transmission of knowledge? And uh, in fact, uh, um, fieldwork wasn't the proper place uh, for a woman, and uh, she never did uh, much fieldwork at all. So it's no wonder that she didn't get involved in all this interdisciplinary work that meant um, doing uh, fieldwork. So museums was a better fit for women, for women, so the expectations that society had for women um, to, of how women should behave. So they were with cataloging, cleaning artifacts, um, making inventories, publishing sometimes, and she was 
she, she published quite a lot, but many of the women who were working in museums at this time um, didn't do this. So all these first women who started to work in the discipline, uh, what happened after the First World War is because so many men died and, and women were needed uh, in the workplace, we then see the first women going really into, or, or a, a, a high number of uh, women going into archaeology. But still, um, we don't see them uh, much. And what we see is at this time, there was this, um, and we are going to see that later on as well, that if a woman, so women went and got, um, uh, got instruction, went to universities, and for example, uh, Margaret Elizabeth, that I haven't been able to find a, a photograph uh, of her, she was the one who started in palynology. And she was the one who introduced her, uh, then her husband, Harry Godwin, um, to, into palynology. But he's the one who then got a professorship and um, then uh, when um, they got uh, uh, their son, she stopped uh, working. So there was this expectation that women accepted as well, in many cases, this expectation, um, uh, society's expectation, and, uh, and women had uh, believed uh, or were believing uh, in these expectations in many times, uh, many times um, that um, they couldn't really make compatible their professional life and uh, working life. So when their son uh, was born, um, she stopped working. She was just a companion, the wife behind the big man. And it's Harry Godwin then who came together with Graham Clark in this Finland research committee. OK, um, then um, <clears throat> Second World War, and the same happened. Um, there were many men uh, dying, and um, and again women were needed. We see again more in uh, more and more women into the discipline, but we see a sort of a division of labor. Uh, you see here this um, uh, the, uh, in the National Museum uh, this uh, Bok laboratory uh, created in uh, Denmark that you see how, um, you know, we, uh, the, the, the woman as a secretary while the men are doing the hard work. But it is at this time, in fact, that the first women appear as, uh, in, in the world of palynology, that is the one that I've been going into a bit uh, uh, in more depth, um, that the first uh, women start to be, uh, to specialize in, um, in, in, uh, in the subject. So, because it's, uh, it's such an interdisciplinary thing, what we find is we are going to find women in, uh, in the fields of prehistory, in the fields of geology, and the fields of sciences, biology, um, and we find them um, in uh, all these um, disciplines. So, um, we find uh, Arlet Le Guaguran. I'm going to talk about Arlet Le Guaguran, and then I will mention also Josefina Menendez Amor. Uh, and Arlet Le Guaguran, uh, trying to know about her, again, there's all these thousands of books about Andre Le Guaguran, but not that many, not that much about her. And um, they're, they're <coughs> what I found was some biographies. Uh, again, written by, uh, uh, by these three authors, um, the two women were disciples of, uh, of hers. So we can see a pattern of them sort of um, training other women. So who was Atlet Le Guaguran? She came uh, from a good family, um, studied in the Col du Louvre, um, then met uh, André Le Guaguran, and uh, I mean, she, they were working in they, this is the time when the Musée de Long was being organized. Uh, it opened in uh, 1937, but by then they had married, and he had got a job in, uh, to get collections in Japan. So they moved to Japan, and um, she then, her life was for, uh, to start with, for 15 years, it was dedicated to help um, her husband. So uh, this is a photograph that she took about the young uh, Le Waguran uh, in Japan. 
So 15 years to, for the education of uh, their four children and then doing helping him, so it's the, the wife behind the big man, um, working with all sorts of administration and, and so on. So, but then in <coughs> 1954, she returned to research uh, and then she decided that palynology was a good um, area where she could do some work, was trained by Madeleine uh, van Campo, and, um, and then uh, she started to publish in palynology and developed her own career and had uh, and trained many, uh, uh, many people, uh, many, many students, many of them uh, women. So, but why was she allowed to work in palynology. She never had an efficient job. So uh, she was a volunteer working. She had a lab in the Musée de Long, but she didn't have a proper job. Um, it was sort of, okay, uh, her husband was there, so she didn't need a proper job. She, and, uh, and I mean, the thing is that she accepted that and her husband accepted that. So, we have to, is how society really influences the, the choices that women make sometimes because she never was unhappy about that situation. Um, and uh, so what we can see here, and she says this <clears throat> in 1971, she, was, she complained when she was made president of the uh, Société Préhistorique Française um, she was, uh, she complained that palynology was only considered an auxiliary science. So um, I think that that's why women went into palynology and other sciences at the time, because they were non mainstream. So we have, she was working as a volunteer and she was working in an auxiliary science. So that was the place where women themselves sometimes uh, thought that they could enter the profession. Um, Josefina Menendez Amor, um, she was an archaeologist. She uh, graduated in pharmacy and natural sciences. She was in the university. She never married. So here we, yes, she got a professorship, but this is this decision. So if you really want to be a professional, you cannot have a personal life. Um, she was trained in this case by Franz uh, uh, Florzutz, um, in the Netherlands, and she collaborated, or they collaborated uh, together for many years. Um, and uh, and <coughs> she worked uh, often with archaeologists. But when I asked Pilar Lopez, who was of the next generation, she, why she hadn't, she didn't seem to have much to do with her, um, she said, I went to talk to her, and she was not interested in me whatsoever. Uh, because uh, I was not uh, in science, I was an archaeologist and so on. So sometimes these women not necessarily help other uh, w uh, women. Uh, my third uh, example here was Maria Hopf, uh, who graduated in uh, botany. And uh, she, again, this is another woman who, um, um, I've, as far as I can see, of what I've been reading, didn't have a personal life. Um, she moved to the Römisch Germanisches Zentralmuseum in Mainz, and um, she then uh, developed this line of archaeobotany. Uh, and um, even if she hadn't been trained as an archaeologist, she did a lot of work uh, in many parts of the world, uh, especially uh, also, also in Spain. So from that first generation of women, we find then a second generation in the 70s that is still women. And I'm not going to develop it because I haven't got the time, but um, they also, uh, I mean, um, Pilar Lopez was trained by Arlette Leroy Rouran, uh, then uh, Michelle Dupré, who in fact, uh, I mean, she was French, but went and, start, and developed her career in Spain, or Blanca Ruiz Zapata, who was uh, really the, uh, um, the disciple of uh, Menendez Amor. So these are examples that I have developed for my own work and so to Spain, uh, France. So was interdisciplinarity an alternative form uh, of access to the discipline? Um, yes, I think it was. 
Was this process different to that taken in other disciplines? No, we have seen that it is happening in other disciplines as well, other national trends. I'm sure that there are, I haven't been able to go so deep, but it seems that they are very sort of similar in many countries. But what happened when auxiliary sciences stopped being auxiliary to become mainstream? And then you start finding men. So men, men, men. So we have here an example of a group of very Catalan, young Catalan archaeologists. This is when they were not nobody. They were just the students. You find the men uh, in the higher row, the women in the lower row, and they, they were excavated together and published together about all these different sciences. It was a very exciting moment. Uh, you know, after the dictatorship, when Catalan uh, became an autonomous uh, province, but who then got jobs? They got the jobs, the men got the jobs, and um, you know, or most of the men got the jobs. That was mainstream archaeology, that's where the jobs were at that time, in the late 80s and like early uh, 90s, and they were there. They, the situation then, I have to say, has improved. Um, they are now, um, here there are people in, in the disciplinary, or not so much, but you know, uh, it is their students who are now starting to get into universities. It is getting a bit more varied. So not everything is bad, uh, uh, but what I would say is, is everything, has everything gone back to normal? Okay, let's go to the open ceremony of this EIA. <laughs> How many women were there in the open ceremony? Uh, you know, uh, there was one, last one, and these are only some of the men. There were men, 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 and this is our previous 2019, and still all the prices to men, every, the, the big men are men and not women. Aren't there women, enough women now, in an association that is more women, that have more women than men? It's just the young uh, student, as a student, who has to give the last talk. So I think this is still quite to do. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.